Hi, my name is Ben Howard. Welcome to this session called Turbocharge Your Power BI Report Development with AI or Artificial Intelligence. So the first thing I want to ask you is what were you doing in 1989? It's a great question. Some of you may not have been born. Some of you might have been toddlers. Some of you might have been working for several years. I was working, well, I wasn't working. I was in my last year of university, I did a fairly new subject at the time. It was called computer science. And I spent my time in my last year on this type of machine. This is a SunSpark workstation. Um, we used it to run the artificial intelligence lab. It itself ran several uh, dumb terminals, as we would call them today. But what did I do on this machine? Well, I was in the artificial intelligence lab. I did my final year on artificial intelligence, but mainly I played backgammon. I learned how to play backgammon on this sort of machine. Okay, uh, so it wasn't the best use of my time, but I did do my final year of dissertation and I did it in... Uh, a system that we would today see as a knowledge management system. It was actually a decision tree system. So we took a load of a domain knowledge, a set of domain knowledge, and answered questions to get to the right sort of answer. Kind of an early chat bot, if you like. Okay, so why do I mention that? Well, 1989 was the beginning of my career in IT. You can do the maths, I'm sure. I was, uh, I was uh, how old was I then? I was 23 years old at that stage. So you can work out how old I am at the end of my career. My point is, it's taken a whole generation for AI to become, to move from something which was fairly unique and very, um, very specialized in terms of I did it in my final year of a computer science degree through to today where AI is pretty much pervasive wherever we are. Okay, so what are we going to look at? Well, we'll look at the agenda. We'll have a look at, you know, is AI any good? And then we'll split into these sorts of things where we'll get an overview of a data set. We'll use AI to create a data set for a proof of concept. And we'll explore then Microsoft's AI tool, which is called Copilot. And we'll explore that as a model developer, a report designer, and as a report viewer. OK, before we get started, I wanted to put this slide up, which is called Mistakes Are Possible. On the right hand side of the screen, you'll see a screenshot, which is a Microsoft screenshot. What I'd like to say about mistakes are possible is that they are more likely to be accepted, those mistakes that AI can generate for you, by inexperienced people. Now, why is that? Well, I want to put this screenshot up and... Uh, kudos and reference goes out to Kurt Buhler from Data Goblins who produced this. I'll give you a link to this uh, later on. So let's take any area of expertise. There's really three pieces of information you might know about. And uh, well, there's really two pieces of information you might know about an area that you're that you know something about. You can you can apply this to cooking, riding a bicycle, writing DAX doing some stuff as a SQL full stack developer or just as a full stack developer. So the blue box is, you know what you know. So I know some stuff about, let's just say DAX. And then in the yellow box, there are some things I know about, but I don't know sufficient about that information. So you could take something like the coalesce function. So I know the coalesce function exists in DAX, but I don't know how to use it. Then... The circle beyond that, that third circle, is unknown unknowns. There's some stuff about DAX that I don't even know exists, okay, because either I've not read the latest documentation or I'm just unaware that um, it's actually there. We call those unknown unknowns. Now, the fourth circle here that Kurt nicely describes is what you can't know about because it doesn't really exist. OK, now Kurt calls that bullshit uh, and people bullshit people all of the time when chat GPT or any generative AI technology produces something which is bullshit uh, because it it creates a logical connection between two items which perhaps couldn't exist in the real world. In generative AI terms, we call that 
hallucinations. So we get generative AI to create something which is untrue, couldn't happen, and that term is a hallucination. Okay, so why are these hallucinations more likely to be believed by somebody who, who isn't particularly expert? Okay, well, let's split uh, our skill level um, across that uh, area of expertise into three. We could be a novice or a beginner, an intermediate and an expert. Now, as we move from being a novice to an intermediate, then that blue area, what I know, becomes larger. And as we move to being an expert, it becomes even larger. OK, now, obviously, as we move to being an expert, there are more things that we don't know about because or not that we don't know about. But that circle gets kind of bigger. The red area, I didn't even know this exists, actually gets smaller. OK, so if you take an expert on something, they are an expert, of course, because they know a lot about that area of expertise. And therefore, the bits that they know little about is really small. The bullshit area the made up truth, if you like, stays about the same. OK, so if you ask a beginner about something, you're much more able to uh, tell that beginner about things that they don't know. But also you're probably able to convince them about things that don't actually exist. Whereas if you go to see an expert and you try and convince them about something that exists, they're going to question you much harder and you're going to have a less opportunity to pull the wool over their eyes, if you like. OK, so that's why um, mistakes are possible and are more likely to be accepted by the inexperienced. So when generative AI creates a hallucination, if you're a novice, you're much more likely to believe that hallucination. Let's also talk about what Copilot or sorry, what generative AI is good at. So I'm going to talk here about soft accuracy versus hard accuracy. Soft accuracy is where an output does not have a precise definition. OK, so let's have a look at this slide here. Here's a photo of a handsome person doing his Bachelor of Science degree many years ago in 1989. If I write an Adobe Firefly prompt, now Adobe Firefly is a generative AI tool that generates images from texts, I can say, I'd like a man standing with his right arm around a woman, she is holding a glass of wine, etc, etc. And Adobe Firefly within 30 seconds or so will generate me an image uh, on the right. OK, so it's that, that's that's accurate, but it's kind of soft accuracy. OK, whereas if we have a look at something called hard accuracy, the output has a very def a very narrow definition of success. Even in fact, there may be one right or one wrong answer. The second error in yellow there is it says or the second bullet point that I've highlighted when it comes to outputs about the data, there is typically only a single correct answer. The truth. OK, so if I think about if I'm asking what are my month on month sales or year on year sales, there's one answer that I want. That accurate that answer has to have a hard accuracy around it. OK, so we talk about Gen AI and what it's good at and how you can use it. If you want more information, have a look at the link there on the screen. Um, or the QR code on the screen. And thank you to Kurt for him allowing me to use his slides. OK, so the first thing I want to do is to analyze some existing data. So let's just go and open up Excel. OK, so let's have a look at this Excel file. I downloaded this file from the US Bureau of Transport Statistics. It's about airline delays. And as I tab around this using control period, I can go to the bottom of this table. I can see that it's got 22,622 rows. OK, so let's load that up into ChatGPT. And the first thing we're going to do is before we, we look at anything else, I want to zoom in here and you can see that it says chat GPT can make mistakes. Check important info. OK, so again, it's the same warning that I have kind of highlighted before. What I did was I uploaded this file to chat GPT and then I said analyze this file and provide an overview of the data. And you can see that it says the data set contains information about airline delays across various airports and carriers, including specific delay causes. And then it gives me an overview of the key columns and we can scroll down and have a look at those. 
Okay, I then used one of its prompts and said, can you analyze for causes of delays? Chat GPT-4 for a little while, and it comes back with these delay, well, the delay causes summary table. Okay, so you can see that the carrier delay is 36% at the top there, late aircraft delay is 40%. I'm not quite sure what the difference between a carrier delay and a late aircraft delay is, but hey ho, uh, I'm not in the transport uh, department. So I then said, can you then present the delays as a percentage of each other as a bar chart? ChatGPT came back and said, yes, I can. And notice the blue icon at the top there that says now interactive, so I could interact with this data. That's really neat. So as far as analyzing data is concerned, I think um, generative AI is pretty good at that. It, it will give me a, a pretty good overview fairly quickly about what we've got in the data. Okay, then what I decided to look at was how good is ChatGPT or Copilot in Bing at creating data for me? So I might want to go and create a data set for a proof of concept or just to test something out of the customer. So I gave ChatGPT this um, prompt. Let's just go through that. Basically, it said, I'd like you to create a or generate a data set with 500,000 rows, each row representing a single sales transaction. Uh, my row or data set is about coffee. Uh, the columns should contain unique transaction ID that should represent a GUID, we need a customer number. I want a certain percentage of the rows to have a valid customer number, of which 80% of those rows are repeat customers. A customer email address for every valid customer number. A coffee type, so that's either going to be flat white, Americano, latte, espresso, macchiato, long black, or cappuccino. And there's a certain distribution of those coffees. Some sort of date field, so I'm generating data for the last three full years, and I'm looking for an increase of dates between 5% and 20% each year, representing you know that uh, my sales are generally increasing, and an increase in percentage during the summer months as well. A to-go field, so I want to know whether the coffee's to go or not. A decaf field, I want to know if somebody's ordered decaf coffee or not. And then, of course, a size field, do I want extra large, large, medium, or small? And there should be more large coffees than all the other sizes combined. And then, finally, output this little lot to a CSV file. So we can do that. Uh, and, in fact, you can see I've done that in Copilot in, uh, my, in uh, Edge, Microsoft's browser. What we can do then is that will generate for me generally some Python code. I can then go and import that Python code into a online Python um, compiler. And from there, we can generate a file. You can see it there, sales underscore transaction CSV. And from there, I can download that file and I can import it into Power BI. This is what it looks like. So how happy am I with this? Well, uh, we've certainly got 500,000 records of data, so that was pretty nice. It probably took about 15, 20 minutes for this Python code to run, but again, that was okay. It took me a couple of attempts to get it right, and I'm a novice Python user, so I had to go back and ask Copilot to fix the errors that I had, or that it had created in the, in the uh, Python file itself, but you know, that was okay, it all worked. Um, and I ended up with this, as I say, this data set. So, some things that we can see across the top left, we have a line graph. You can see my sales actually are decreasing from January 2023 to July 2026. Uh, the sales decreased in the summer months rather than increasing. So, you know, I've got some issues there which I could fix. If we have a look at the count of coffees, I've got my coffee split up between the coffee types. So the top row or the middle row there, if you like, shows actual numbers. The bottom row shows the same data, but as a percentage. If I go down to the bottom right, uh, we can see that my large coffees make up 50%, which is just about the same or is the same as the aggregation of a sum of the medium, small and extra large coffees there. Okay, so I'm quite happy about that. One thing that didn't do so well, as well as um, increasing my sales that we talked about, is that customer emails, uh, I don't have actually many repeat customers. Uh, the best customer I had repeated over um, two and a half years was msmith at example.com who came in 21 times. So 
I've got some work to do on my prompt, but was it easy to create this data set and bring it into Power BI? Yes, it was. OK, I used to spend a lot of time in Excel creating fantastic data sets using lots of if statements and various random factors. I now just pretty much do this all in uh, ChatGPT or Copilot. OK. The next thing I want to talk about is bringing data into Power BI. And in this case, again, I'm going to ask Copilot to write me some M code. So here we can see I've pasted into ChatGPT, write me the M code that will bring the following file into Power BI. Make sure the code is well commented and I want the file to bring in. The file I want to bring in has the following path and I've given it that path that I downloaded before. So ChatGPT goes away and creates the M code, which I can then copy and I can bring that directly into Power BI. Let's have a look at that. So there's the code copied. Here I am in Power BI. I'll go and create a blank query. That, of course, opens up for me Power Query, Power Query Editor. I can go into the Advanced Editor. I can just paste that code in and click OK. OK, so now I get an error and it says the column customer name cannot be found. If I go and have a look at the previous step promoted headers and press Control G to go to the column, I don't actually have a column called customer name. Okay, so here is where ChatGPT has hallucinated for me. It has created and assumed that I've got lots of columns and it's going to change the types on those columns. Now, in fairness, I didn't ask it to analyze the file and then bring it in. I just said bring it in. So it made some assumptions. So I can go and edit the M code and you can see that once I've done that, I can bring in the 500,000 rows. Now, let's go and have a look at Copilot specifically, so Microsoft's implementation of generative AI within its whole suite of products. So I'm going to have a look at Copilot in data flows. Now a data flow, in case you didn't know it, is basically Power Query, but implemented in the cloud service. Data flow provides data transformations. Power Query doesn't have Copilot. I don't know whether it's going to have Copilot. So I can't demo Copilot in Power Query. Rather, I have to go into a data flow. OK, so here we are in data flows. Uh, I've loaded in the data that I had before. You can see I've got the transaction ID I've highlighted, and then I've got a Copilot button. So I can write into Copilot what I would like Copilot to do, or well, the data flow to do. So remove the transaction ID column. So I can type that in, Copilot thinks about it, and it removes the column nicely for me. So, so far, so good. I can then say, let's go and create a year column from the date column. So that would be a typical thing that you might do if you haven't already got a date table. So it thinks about it and it goes and creates me a year column. But some of those years have errors. OK, now I kind of figure it's because the date column is of type text. It's not yet of type date. And so to fix that, I can under the previous query and say, change the date column to be of type date. So again, it goes and does that, but I've still got a specific error. Let's undo that and have a look at why we might have that error. Well, it's because that particular field has got a time component in it. So I can say, take the date column and keep only the characters before the space. So now I've just got the date column. I've got rid of the time component and I can say, convert the date column into a date type, which it now does. Happy days. So now I can say extract for year from the date column into a new field. Now, power. Now, Copilot doesn't understand that at the moment. It says I can't do that right now and I have an unexpected error. OK, the error doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't give me anything valid. So I'm wondering, does it like the term field and should I replace the term field with column? So I do that. OK, so what Copilot's done for me now is it's turned that date column into the year column. And you can see that it's used for transform columns, date, each date, dot year. That's good. But what I said was extract the year from the date column into a new column. OK, so it's not done exactly what I asked. At this stage, I kind of gave up with Copilot in data flows. It would have been a lot quicker for me to just do this manually. So in terms of was this a success? Well, Copilot works, but I wouldn't use this in a production environment. OK, now let's go and use Copilot in 
Power BI. So we're moving away from data flows back into the Power BI desktop. And a few things that I might want to do as the model designer is I can write some DAX to evaluate the data and I can also create new measures. Let's switch over to Power BI to have a look at that. Here we are back in that report. You can see that I've got a DAX button on the right hand side. So the first thing I'm given is evaluate top 100 and I can run that and that DAX is created for me already and I can go and have a look at the top 100 uh, rows. I can also have a look at a quick query and have a look at the data preview. So I can do that by selecting coffee type, right click and say quick preview. And you can see I've got my list of coffees in there. I can also open up a new query pane, click on the Copilot button there and say suggest some measures for me. So Copilot will go away and it will create, in this case, about 26 lines of DAX, which we can look at, which defines for me initially four measures and then goes and evaluates those and shows those measures to me. So if we go and run this DAX, you can see that I now have a table for each coffee type for the number of transactions, the unique customers, etc., etc. So this is all well and good. I can click on keep that query. And then you can see I can update the model with the changes, i.e. these new measures. Let's just go and select this measure and say, I'd like to add that measure into the model. I can click on the button there, select to update the model. And now I've got a new measure in my model called go to count. Let's just go and use that measure. So I'll go back to page one. We'll just resize and I'll take the go to count measure change that to a table and then add in the coffee type. Okay, so now we can see how many go to how many coffees we sold of each type, which were to go rather than go to to go coffees. Okay, back onto DAX, let's create a new query, go back into my copilot preview. And this time I can say write a DAX query to show how many decaf coffees were sold. So again, copilot interprets that writes me a DAX query, which I can then run, and it tells me I've got 62,214. I can go and check that, of course, by using the table view and just checking that those numbers are the same if I filter on decaf. Now, I'm going to keep that query. Now, this just is an evaluation of the data. So if I go and add in a new query number six, I'll then say, let's take that, but write that as a DAX measure, okay, which it does. But notice it says sales transactions copilot coffee type equals coffee. Well, that's wrong, okay, because coffee type is Americano, espresso, etc. So if I get rid of that, my DAX measure is now correct. So you can see how Copilot, if I add in two similar prompts, actually comes back with two different results, one of which is correct and one of which is incorrect. I'm not sure I'd call it a, a hallucination, but uh, it's certainly not right. So in terms of would I use Copilot to write DAX to evaluate the data and to create new measures, I'd use it as a starting point. I'd use it as part of a learning process. Okay, whilst we're in Power BI, why don't we have a look at how we can use Copilot in Power BI to go and create a report. So I'm in the same report as I was before. I've clicked on the Copilot button and here you can see it says, welcome to Copilot in Power BI. We're in the desktop. Simplify your work. Mistakes are possible. So let's click on the get started button. Now I'm given some things that I can try. So I'm just going to say create a new report page. Copilot works on this for a little while and then comes back and says to create a new report page, I need to understand the structure of your data set. This will help me suggest relevant visuals and metrics for your report. I'll start by retrieving the data set schema and we can see the data set there. So now I can type in the prompt. I want a report page that shows the number of coffee sales over time and the percentage of coffee sales by coffee type and size in a matrix. The report should also contain a filter for whether the coffee is to go or not. Let's see what Power BI and specifically Copilot does with that. Okay, so we wait about 40 seconds or so. 
and this is the page which is produced for me. It gives me an outline. OK, your new report page is done. Here's an outline. Title, Coffee Sales Analysis, which it does. We've got some key metrics in there. We've got some visuals and we've got some slices. And of course, we can check whether this works or not. Would I use this report straight off? No, of course I wouldn't. But it is valid. It is the right sort of data. And of course, I could go and publish that to a Power BI service. OK, so there's a couple of other things that I can then do either as a report designer initially, which is let's go and investigate a semantic model and then I can use Copilot as a report viewer. Let's initially do this and investigate a semantic model. So here we are in the Power BI service. This is the report which I just previously published, DAX Copilot Data Only, and I can click on this button which says Explore This Data. And in the Data Overview, I now have a Create This Overview with Copilot. So again, I can go and get Copilot to go and query the model and give me some, if you like, soft accuracy information about the model. It tells me this semantic model contains sales transaction data, etc. We can close that off. Now, again, if I've got the rights to do this, I can auto create a report from this model. You've already seen me do this from the Power BI desktop, but I can also do it from the service. We often have a title. In this case, it's called Quick Summary. We have some cards across the top there. And then we have multiple line graphs, often with a large line graph on the left hand side and some narrative about that line graph below that. So as a report developer, I could use this button to try and give me a first go at creating a report. Now, one of the things that I might want to do is provide a narrative to that report. So if we edit the report and change a few things around, we can go and add in this visual, which is our narrative visual. Again, with Copilot enabled, I can say, let's create a narrative with Copilot. Now, having not typed anything in, it will go away and summarize the data, which again is pretty neat. Again, I think about this as being generative AI, which has a soft accuracy. So it gives me some words about the data. This actually combines soft accuracy and hard accuracy, if you like, because it will look at the visuals and it says to go count, total to go count for 2025 stands at 785. Now it's found that off a visual and it cites the visuals that it's found the data from. So these narratives are pretty nice. What I could then do is again, click on one of the suggestions, which is answer likely questions from the leadership. So now our prompt is summarize the data, but then based on the data, what questions are likely to be asked by the leadership and answer these questions. So as this refreshes, I then get a slightly different summary and a slightly different set of uh, information. Now, as I already mentioned, this summary comes from some visuals and I can choose which visuals on which pages I want to reference. By default, the narrative will reference everything. But of course, you can choose uh, to include or exclude certain visuals and certain pages that will make up the information on the narrative. Now, one last thing to point out is that if I add a slicer in here, let's go and add in that decaf slicer, then when I change the slicer, then of course the narrative is regenerated. Now that narrative will remain constant. So if I turn decaf back off and then switch it back on, the narrative will be the same until of course the whole data set is refreshed. So if I select certain data points and certain filters, that narrative will change to reflect those data points and filters. As mentioned previously, each piece of information is cited by a reference number. That reference number relates to an item on the page. If we click the reference number for, or if we hover over a reference number, it gives us the data that we get it from. And if we click on it, then it will highlight and spotlight just that particular reference. OK, so as a report developer, I can generate some automatic narrative to put 
on the page. What about if I'm a report viewer? Now, of course, the majority of our users are going to be report viewers. Again, if they have the rights, then they'll have the co-pilot button on the top here. Now, you can see I have a preview button here. So as a report viewer, I can ask questions about the report and the data on the report, which effectively is what the narratives has done there. We've taken data and we've provided a narrative based upon information in the report. With this preview button selected, Copilot can interrogate the model. Okay, that's important. Copilot can interrogate the model. And so therefore, we can potentially get data about information in the model, which is not displayed or made available on the report. So here's an example. I've said, give me an executive summary. So Copilot will go along. Again, it will look at the data in the report and it will give me some information about that. A little bit like the narrative. I can then answer specific questions which aren't necessarily on the report, but which we can deduce. So which month had the most sales of Espresso? And it comes back and gives me a card view showing that October, we had a count of transaction ID of 19,364. And I haven't checked if that's right, but I would want to check that that would be the number of espressos sold. Then I can say, show me the sales of coffee by coffee type in a column chart. So here's where we produce, again, some new data, so a bit of generative AI producing that column chart for us. Now, maybe I want to be a bit, let's just say, naughty, and I want to try and get at some information in the model which isn't presented to me. So I could say something along the lines of show me customer email addresses. What I'm trying to get at here is personally identifiable information, PII. Now, initially what Copilot does is it says there's no content here I can work with. Try making a new request. So I can say list for customer email addresses. It doesn't work. Show me the data in the semantic model. That request doesn't work. But eventually, after about eight minutes of trying, so remember this is only eight minutes of trying, I entered the prompt, how many unique customer email addresses are there? Or how many unique customer email are there? And it comes back which say, and it says the total number of unique customer emails is 138,000. And from there I enter, what is the most common value for customer email? Okay. Again, it works on it. It comes back and it gives me a list of customer email addresses. Okay, That list does not exist on the report anywhere. It does exist in the semantic model. So if I use this preview feature of Copilot, then I'm able to get at data in the semantic model, which is not placed on the screen. Now, you might think this is a security flaw. It's actually not. Microsoft will tell you the only permissions, the only way you can actually secure the data in the semantic model is by using row level security or object level security. However, there is another way you can obscure the data and that's by hiding the columns. So any hidden tables and hidden columns are ignored by Copilot. So if I was to hide those values and then run that query again, then Copilot would not come back with the list of email addresses because they've been hidden within the model. Okay, so that was a quick look at using generative AI to boost your productivity when you're creating Power BI reports and models. We did quite a few things in the session but to summarize it and to think about the best practices i would say you know please do use generative ai to support your power bi work as a developer you're looking for hard accuracy and as a report creator you're really looking for soft accuracy i.e create me a report but then when we look at this as a report viewer 
and we use Copilot and the Copilot pane to provide answers either in a narrative visual or in the Copilot pane visual, we're using a mixture of soft accuracy, words to describe some things, and then some numbers. Those numbers will be correct on the narrative as long as your visuals are correct. The narrative will always look at the visuals. However, for report viewers, when we use the Copilot pane to ask questions, then there's a few things we need to think about. Like all systems, this is a rubbish in, rubbish out system. So if you've got rubbish data in there, we know as Power BI developers that you're going to get rubbish data out. Our visuals, our numbers are going to be rubbish. So to aid our users, obviously we clean up our data. We make sure that the data has integrity when we put it in there. We want to rename columns to be sensible names and we will use synonyms. So instead of cust underscore number or NO, we would use customer space number. We would spell it out in English. English, of course, because most large language models are trained on the Internet and most of the Internet, I'm afraid to say, is in some form of English. But of course, not all of it is correct. So be aware of hallucinations. Definitely hide tables and columns that you don't want to expose to Copilot to that pain. And as said, use row level security and object level security to restrict access to your data. This is something I'm doing in the real world for every model now where we, well actually every model, regardless of whether I use RLS for filtering, I always create a role and add users to that role and only those users can access the model. So even if a model is shared with them accidentally, if they're not in the RLS role to access that data, then they don't get to see it. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you found this interesting, and do have a great day.